Four years ago, I got a letter in the mail from a kid that said he was a teenager and he had figured out how to start fixing boards off of my videos and that he was starting his own business doing it. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And then I saw that he actually had good ratings online, had his own website, and seemed quite serious about it. In my own YouTube chat, he was answering questions from other people who, were as, who had their own repair stores, and he was giving them the right answers. And this was something that was very encouraging to me at the time, because it meant that I was not talking into an abyss or a vacuum, that when I was saying, here is a problem, here is the thought process I used to fix the problem, here is the fixed problem, that it, I wasn't just talking to myself or just making useless entertainment, but that somebody was not only learning from it, but applying it to help fix other people's stuff. And one of the earliest people that seems to have really benefited from this stuff was uh, Tim Herman. So I'd like to have him on for an interview today. He has his own business in California that accepts mail-in repairs from all over the country. And if you are on a budget, he does charge less money than I do. So I would highly suggest checking him out. Can you let me know what it is your company does? Okay, so what we do is repair uh, MacBooks at component level, so component level board repair, primarily on liquid damage devices, and um, most of the work we get is from other repair stores, so we actually fix the stuff that other repair stores can't uh, or send out, so like a lot of the general computer repair stores, they don't do board level, so a lot of them send it here. So now, in the beginning, what venues did you use to acquire your customers? Okay, so... One of the first things I did is I built a really lousy website and then um, I started listing board repair on eBay, which was a really bad idea. So what I would do is I would create a bunch of listings for, um, for board repair on eBay, you know, each is an individual item. And uh, this was a very bad idea because this you, you will get literally the bottom of the barrel board repairs and the bottom of the barrel customers that are just complete, complete headaches. So don't do that. And that was one of the mis mistakes I made as well. Why do you think that eBay attracts bottom of the barrel customers in a service based business? It's cheap. Everything on the, a lot of, uh, it's a lot cheaper than other places. So you get a lot of the people that don't want to pay any money for it. How did you start gaining your own customers when you decided I'm not dealing with eBay anymore? Since eBay is an established platform, everybody knows to go to it, but not everybody may know to go to your website, which you just put up yesterday. So how did you get people to actually show up? So I find that to be one of the hardest things when opening any new business is how do you get your first couple of clients? So what I did was I, uh, one, I created a better website. So I had this really, really, really lousy website. I got rid of all that. I created a semi-decent website. It still wasn't the best. It had a real domain. Um, this was another thing. Like my first website was just like the free Wix domain. Um, my real website was www.tcrscircuit.com, um, which is in inactive now. But I created that website. And then what I would do is I would go to the local repair stores. So I would go to any of the places I would offer computer repair. And I'd say, hey, I, I do motherboard repair on MacBooks. Um, this is what I do. This is how I do it. I would show them pictures of my uh, my work area and stuff like that, showing pictures of stuff I've soldered. And um, I finally found a store that, that gave me something. They had a uh, MacBook that was quarter fan spinning. I took it, um, you know, took it back to my office. And this was pretty much my first board repair. And I noticed if I held the power button down for like 10 seconds, it would turn on normally. And I figured this, figured what it was, was the ISL 6259. It was the ISL 6259 and then two current sense two current sensing resistors for charger. So I um, ended up fixing that board and returned it back to them, and they paid me a course. And then from that, I actually bought my first microscope, which, which was an Amscope SC400. Prior to that, I was just using this uh, this digital microscope that you couldn't really see anything. Like if you if you were to zoom in on an area of the board at like a resistor, you couldn't tell the difference between the resistor and the board because they're just so resolution. You just see you'd have to look at the caps on on the end of the resistor, and that's the only way you'd be able to tell it was separate from the board. I think it took me like an hour to solder one resistor just because you couldn't see anything. But yeah, I, I, I got paid for that one. Um, they gave me two more to fix, and um, then I bought a microscope, and that was a huge help. Now, in the beginning, how did you set yourself apart from other people in the field? So one thing I did is I, I started offering a one-year warranty. So when I first, uh, like when I first tried stuff and when I was, uh, 
listing stuff on eBay. I put a 30 day warranty because I thought that was good enough. It's not good enough. Um, so I figured I want to give people confidence in what I do. So I started offering a one year warranty. So this, what this did is this added credibility to me. At least some people saw that I would stand by my work and not like a lot of the other 30 day warranty places. Um, you'll get a ton of those on eBay that they offer a 30 day warranty and they probably won't even back it. So I offered a one year warranty and that, that helped build trust in people. And that set, set, set me out. Um, you know, for some form of credibility. Yeah. Now, when you were in the beginning of your business, one of the things you had mentioned is that you were about 15 or 16 years old. And I remember when I was 17 years old and I had started with uh, working at Avatar Studios, I remember working on this, uh, these uh, bus switches for the SSL J9000 console. And I had, at one point, I'd been working for seven or eight hours. I was thirsty. I went to get a a little cup of water before I brought the board back into the studio. So I was carrying this little SSL J9000 cheap switch board in my left hand. I grabbed a cup of my right hand, drank the water, tossed it out, and then uh, some, and then brought the board into the studio room. And one of the people that was working there, I'm never going to forget, actually ratted on me to management and said, Lewis is washing boards in the water cooler, which I was not doing. It's just it's one of the things that I've noticed over and over again when you're young is that regardless of how educated you appear, or regardless of how competent you appear to be, or competent, competent, and or of your track record, people still believe that you have no idea what you're doing just because you're young. So how did you overcome that in an industry where you're dealing with people's data, you're dealing with expensive devices, and customers already kind of have low trust for most independent repair? How, how did you deal with this? So this was like one of um, the one of the hardest things that I could overcome. This was one of the hardest things I had to overcome when I was starting. So pretty much I would get a lot of it and I wouldn't really like to tell people how old I was. That was one of the things I tried to do is I tried not to tell people. Um, but eventually it came to the point where um, I went to this iFixit conference. It was the iFixit repair conference, whatever it was called. But um, I got an opportunity to look at a MacBook for someone. So I was upstairs. They have this room where they record stuff and they have a microscope. And I was looking at this MacBook for, for someone. And Jessa was there and she walks in and behind her, like 40 people come in behind her. And I was at the front of the room. Now, keep in mind, I really was, I, I was starting, I, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't, you know what I mean? I, I look back at the stuff I was talking about in that, when I was, you know, talking in front of those people and it's like, I look back and I thought I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but, uh. I basically explained what was wrong with the board. I had my laptop with a schematic and I, I just explained to people, you know, this is why it's not turning on. It was, I think it was an issue with the ISL 6258. I don't remember. It was a, it was an old, like 2008 board, but I explained in front of those people and these are all repair store owners. There's, like I said, there's probably 40 of them in there from all places across the country. So after seeing this, they really had no doubt that I, you know, that I would, they, they trusted me after hearing, hearing me talk and explain it. They, they had a certain level of trust in me that they didn't have before because they, I proved myself. All right. Now you started doing this in your house. So how did you, when, when did you feel it was time to stop doing business out of a bedroom and start doing it out of a commercial retail location? Because this is the area that I think screws a lot of people. They think they need to have the location first, then they dump all the money in and they have no clients and then they go out of business because they run out of money to pay their rent before they can actually build their business. So how did so, you handle this? So like out of the, the house, I was getting no local business. It was all mail-in. So I got to a point where I had my main workbench right here. I had the side workbench like right over here and then right behind it. Like I could not even move my chair back and there was another workbench here because that's the work area I needed. Um, it got to the point where I had a lot of work in while well, looking at it now, I didn't have that much work in, but I had too much work for that area. You know, I was I was like in the corner of a room. I couldn't couldn't fit much more there and I was at the point where my business wasn't growing. So I reached a point where there was no upward trend. It was staying at the same, you know, the same level for several months and it just was not growing. So then I decided to make the move to get a store because, you know, I had, I had decent amount of work coming in, but I, I just wasn't growing and I needed to take that step to grow. Now, one of the things I noticed when I went, if, if I Google your business or Google TCRS circuit is on Yelp and Google, you both have five stars, not four and a half, not 4.8 or 4.9. It's better than mine. How do you consistently keep a five star rating in an industry where customers have a financial incentive to believe that we're screwing them? So even if they don't think we're that bad, if they believe in their head 
that it wasn't like that until I sent it to you, then they have a reason to be justified in not paying the bill. So how is it you're able to keep five stars, none of that, I sent it in for a backlight fuse and you're telling me it needs a screen. I sent it in just for the board and now you're saying it needs a keyboard one star. How do you deal with people in a manner where over the past three and a half years you have no one star reviews that I can see? So the, one of the best ways that I think, now this is something that I don't do intentional, it's just how I conduct myself in business, is I just try and explain it the best I can. So like when, let's say if someone sends something in that's randomly crashing and then it doesn't turn on, I explain to them, basically what was going on, that your CPU was dying, I explained why it was dying, you know, I would explain, uh, moth, sorry, um, but I, I just explain it in a way that they understand and that they could see it at my level. So when, when, when I'm explaining to them, like let's say it was randomly crashing, I explained to them it was randomly crashing from your CPU, your CPU was dying and it just completely died. Like I'll, like let's say if I'm doing a test on a stress test and it died, I'll explain to them the CPU was dying all long, long and it just died you know, right here. It's just kind of the way I just have a way of talking to people that kind of calms the fire down a little bit or calms them down a bit when they're at that point when they're angry and, and want to blame me. I just kind of have a way to just to, just to get through to them that it, you know, it wasn't my fault. Besides eBay, what are the largest mistakes that you made starting out that if you were, if you could like go back three years and tell yourself, don't do this or do so, this that you would do? One of the major mistakes I made in the beginning was telling myself I wasn't smart enough. So I remember watching your videos and I remember going into a hardware store and I remember looking at this pair of tweezers and I thought in my mind with, I, I would never be smart enough to, to do board repair. I would like to, but I would never be that person. I would never be smart enough to do board repair. Um, and that was one of the main mistakes I had at the beginning is I told myself that I couldn't do it, that I wasn't smart enough. I already, I just completely, basically put it off my mind that I could never do it, that I wasn't smart enough. The second big mistake that I made is telling myself that I failed. So starting a business takes time, getting clients takes time. And after you know a few months, I figured that I failed. I wasn't getting the work I wanted in and I figured I failed. I told myself that my business failed and a while there, I didn't really put much work in any marketing or doing anything because I thought I failed. So one of the major things, or one of the worst mistakes that you can do in the beginning is give up too early. So don't give up. Keep going and just, just keep putting everything into it and you will succeed. What was the difference between your mindset and the mindset of the other people who we, uh, I guess, suppose call please bros, which is where they decide, you know, I'm going to ask... The, uh, I have this issue, what I do. I have this issue, what do I do? Whereas you seem to say, I have this issue, here's what I've already tried to do to solve it, here's what I thought would happen, here's what didn't work, and you just keep kind of diving back into it. What kept you in that mindset and kept you from becoming a please bro, and why do you find please bros to be so bothersome? So um, the, my first board, it was, which was actually not a board issue, I actually think I sent a message to Paul Daniels, please, please broing a little bit, but on my second board, what I did is I just put time to figure it out. I looked at the schematic. I thought about it. And after I solved that first board, you get such like, especially your very first board repair that you solve, you get such a sense of reward and it makes you want to do it again. So I got my two other boards in from that one place and I solved those two. And then you get a sense of reward and it just makes you want to keep going. Now, when I was starting, of course, I had questions. Um, I used your forum. I, you know, I now got answers from Duke about some issues that I was stumped on and I learned from that and then I applied those to the next boards and then you just keep, keep going on and on. And eventually I got to the point where I stopped asking questions and I started answering questions and that's, you know, where I, where I am now, basically. Uh, what do you see uh, you doing with your business over the next one or two years? Okay. So one of the things that I've been venturing into more lately is something else. So this is an MRI array receive coil. This is basically, this basically receives a signal from an MRI that basically takes the picture of whatever you're having scans. So this is actually an MRI brain coil. So I've been kind of venturing into this stuff, um, but also keeping growing the MacBook. So like the, the this stuff I'm not really offering as a service yet, but I've been sort of venturing into that and hope to, you know, in the next couple of years that I would be uh, doing some, some of those and also growing the MacBook portion. So I'm basically doing that, hoping to grow uh, MacBook repair even more and also venturing into some other stuff. When you moved into the store, did your business start expanding more because there were more walk-in people to sh the, because you had an actual retail storefront? Was it that you were putting more effort in since you had more room to do business? Or was it both? So I'd say the... Um, 
number one thing how a store helped me was a sense of credibility. When someone looks at your address and then they see it's a residential address, they kind of you kind of lose a sense of credibility in some people's eyes. And having a commercial address, commercial address, really helped me take off because people would see it's a commercial address. They I had more credibility to them, and I just started getting more and more mail in. So walk-ins probably account to five to 10% of my business when mail-in accounts to 90 to 95% of my business. So even having a store with mail-in, one, yes, it added space, but also added a huge sense of credibility to me and my business, you know, compared to working out of the house. What's the advice that you would have for the people that say, I want to get started in this field? What do I do? So number one thing to do is don't give up. Um, never tell yourself that you're not good enough. And one of the things I did, just did is just just started. So I don't say just start and screw up someone's, you know, $3,000 laptop with their data on it, but just basically start, you know, don't, don't stand still start. And another thing is equipment. So I started, I thought I could start with some cheap radio shack iron. Um, don't do that. Um, invest in good equipment. Don't see it as an, don't see it as an expense, but see it as an investment. And this is one of the, the things you can do is just, just get good equipment because a lot of times you'll think you're screwing something up. And when in reality, it's just your equipment is bad. Like sometimes these cheap irons, you just can't do it with that. So get good equipment and just don't give up and, and basically just start. How do you choose when to start investing money into what equipment? Because when people look at the, the, the stations that we have here, they'll see you have about nine or $10,000 of equipment on my desk. So how do you start? How do you start when you don't have that $10,000 to buy all this stuff? How do you figure out what equipment you need, what equipment you don't, where you can skimp in the beginning, where you can't skimp? And how do you choose when it's time to upgrade something? So like one thing, like when, especially when I was starting is, you know, I had no money. I literally, my first board repairs, I did not even have a charger to test the machines with. I just used the battery, the battery voltage that was in them and I, I had no money. So I had this little cheap digital microscope and I used the money that I did have. It was like $210 to buy um, a, a Hacko soldering iron and then this cheap hot air station. So um, basically what I did is it just, as I went, you know, you fix boards, like my first couple of boards that I fixed, I bought the SE 400 microscope. And then as time went on, I bought the, um, Hacko FX 951. And basically just as I went, I just, I, I saved and put that money towards, um, new equipment. And as you get busier, it'll be easier to do and to build up a station. So that was one of the things I got discouraged about is not having good equipment when I, when I started, but basically just as you go is how I did it. Hmm. Well, that's about it. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time. Now, where can people find you online if they're interested in learning more about your business or sending you something? So go to uh, www.tcrscircuit.repair. Also, last one. What, what made you decide you were going to start recording this stuff for YouTube? Um, good question. Um, I basically, like, uh, when I, when I first started, I guess I was just inspired by you and I started to uh, do it. Like even when I had no idea what I was doing, I tried to make a video on it. And I think one of the motivating factors of that is one to see where you were. So I, if I look at my videos, like from like when I first started, it's like, wow, I've grown a lot. And it was one of the, that was one of the things to see where I, where, where I would go in the future and just to show other people that I, you know, if I can do it, you can do it, you know? Yeah, it's interesting going back to my six-year-old videos and seeing that I'm using mold, uh, like wire from an IDE cable that's coming up out of the board and this going back a, into a it. Thing. The solder when marker. I first, when I first started, this is the wire I tried to, to do jumper wires with. Yeah, when I, when I, before working on boards, I tried to do uh, oh, board repair with, with this wire. <laughs> it brings back terrible memories. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. I really no appreciate problem. it.